we want to welcome everyone to our last Leader to Leader of this school year. Thank you for joining us. My name is Colin Rittmaster. I'm the Associate Executive Director at MASSP. With me today is Bob Kefjan and Wendy Zadeb, and then Ryan Casey is running the tech. If you haven't already, please do take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat, including your name, school role, and maybe one hope or question that you have for today. Make sure when doing so that it's set to all panelists and attendees. By default, it goes to all panelists only. And for everyone to be able to see it, please put all panelists and attendees. Also, we want to note that this, um, this leader to leader will be, is being recorded and will be posted for public viewing. And because experts are continuing to learn more about COVID-19 and the conditions surrounding the crisis are continuing evolving as the executive orders do as recently as yesterday, so too do our considerations, guidance, and recommendations change. So please note that the information we're providing you today is current up through to 2 p.m. on June 18th, that's today, and is intended to guide your thinking. We strongly recommend that you engage your decision makers collaboratively at the, dis, uh, at the district level, including teachers, students, parents and families, and the Board of Education. We're here to provide counsel and, um, or excuse me, to provide guidance to you. We are not legal counsel. So if you have questions that are more of legal counsel, we can provide framework for it, but it's important that you seek legal counsel in your district leadership um, when making final decisions. If you're looking for a thought partner beyond today's leader to leader, please feel free to reach out to any of the MESSP team to support you in brainstorming or planning as we encourage you to continue to think forward as the situation on the ground develops. The last thing before we get started, I wanna remind people is that being a webinar, we're able to pose questions using the Q&A function. And so please do, if you have specific questions you'd like addressed, pose those questions within the Q&A function of the Zoom webinar, and note that you can upvote questions, just like you, um, friend requests, you can like, like things or you can that, so just go ahead and like the question, and those move those up to front, and Wendy Zadeb, our executive director, will be moderating that as we go. If you have additional suggestions or ideas or even resources that you think would be helpful for people as we're going through this, feel free to add that to the chat, and we'll continue to do it. Following this webinar, we will send an email to all the participants with a recording of the webinar, as well as a copy of the slide deck for your use in the resources. We'll be posting the webinar for public beyond that in our uh, Monday headlines that go out next week. So with that, please note we're going to have a, a multi-part agenda. We're going to start with an overview of the Michigan Safe Start program and some mitigation strategies. Then we're going to go into an organizational and decision-making chart um, architecture that shows what are the different groups that are meeting right now to provide guidance and direction and possible outcomes. We'll wrap that up then with some local decisions that you need to be thinking about between now, throughout the summer, and into the future. And then we'll end with any general questions and sharing of some resources that will support you as you plan for the 2020-21 school year. So with that, please welcome Bob Kefjan to speak a little bit more about the Michigan Safe Start Plan. So this graphic that you guys see on your screen here is sort of the, the infographic version of the My Safe, Safe Start Plan that was released, <clears throat> excuse me, now a couple of months ago. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, it's worth becoming familiar with. It lays out Michigan's six phase approach to dealing with uh, the current outbreak. Uh, of COVID. And you can see that it starts there at phase one, which is where we started this whole thing, right? It's, it's uncontrolled growth. That's where the growth, the growth rate of infection is growing six, six exponentially um, day over day. Persistent spread is still fast growth. We're still worried about overwhelming the healthcare system. Phase three is flattening where that growth rate starts to come down. It's either not growing as fast, it's flattening entirely, or it's gradually declining a little bit. <clears throat> and those first three phases are where we spent basically the whole spring, right? We started, the whole, we started back with uncontrolled growth, and until uh, the beginning of this month, 
uh, Michigan hadn't gotten past that phase three designation. And then round about Memorial Day, Northern Michigan uh, became the first section of the state to move into phase four, improving. Uh, and what came with that phase four designation is some things opened up a little bit. A little bit of retail opened, there were more options for things to do. Um, <clears throat> but only because cases and hospitalization rates were declining precipitately, uh, and there was no longer the significant worry about overwhelming the healthcare system. And then just a little bit earlier this month, the whole state moved into phase four while Northern Michigan moved into phase five. Uh, and phase five, where Northern Michigan is now, uh, as those of you living in that part of the state know, opens up some restaurants and bars at a limited capacity, gives you a lot more options for group gatherings, including um, in certain venues up to 500 people which is allowing some graduation ceremonies to go forward. And we hope that the rest of the state's gonna move into phase five by the 4th of July. Uh, that's what the governor's office is signaling right now. But that's as far as it's likely to get until we have some sort of a, uh, some way to treat uh, consistently or to uh, inoculate people against COVID uh, because the next stage is phase six. Now all of this, this whole plan that was laid out a couple of months ago, We've seen some uh, evolution to this along the way. And that bit you see in the lower right-hand corner, that was the disclaimer on this from the very beginning, which is that it's being updated and refined as additional guidance and evidence uh, from the CDC and others becomes available. So as we go through these today and what they mean for education, understand that we're going to continue to see changes to this as it moves forward. That's not somebody changing the rules partway through. That's as we learn more about the spread of COVID and how to contain it. Uh, the state is making adjustments to its plan the same way you guys would in your buildings to address what we're learning about the spread of the virus as we move forward. Excuse me. So let's look at phases one through three through the education lens. Uh, be, and I say phases one through three because education and phases one through three is the same, regardless of which of those three phases you're in. And that is we're talking about entirely remote learning. There's no in-person instruction. School buildings are closed for instruction. Uh, social distancing wise, we're maintaining six foot distance from others, not just when we're in public, but when even when we're outdoors, everybody's wearing masks and other face coverings. There are no gatherings permitted at all outside of a household. And that's phases one through three, and that's where we were through the end of May. But then we moved into phase four. And what the initial plan said about phase four as it was related to education was that we would be allowed to do remote learning K-12, but with summer programs in small groups. And so as schools have started planning for their summer programs, they're looking ahead at that and saying, okay, well, I can do some small group summer programs and we know that summer school is allowed. MDE put out a memo clarifying all of that last week. Uh, as long as you follow the workplace safety guidelines, you can have summer school session right now. Um, I'm sorry, not after your last day of school uh, ends for the year. We're still talking about social distancing and face coverings, but we're now allowing some gatherings. But this is the first place where we've seen an evolution in what we had originally. Uh, we heard yesterday from the governor that education is not just limited to remote learning anymore. We're talking about in-person instruction resuming subject to stringent health and safety protocols uh, in phase four. Now, those health and safety protocols won't be out until the end of the month. They're going to be part of the return to learning report uh, that we're going to see from the governor's office on June 30th. Uh, but that's a shift, and it's a welcome shift for a lot of folks in education uh, because it's going to allow more in-person instruction at an earlier phase. But we still don't know what that means, right? Before, it was small group instruction. Now we're saying some in-person instruction, but is that just small group instruction? We don't know and we won't know until June 30th. Phase five, which is where part of Northern Michigan is right now, Northern Michigan and the Upper Peninsula, live instruction is allowed uh, at K-12 and in higher education. And while we're still doing six foot distancing and wearing face coverings wherever possible, uh, we're talking about increased gathering sizes up to 500 people with social distancing in certain venues um, and you know, unlimited access to outdoor recreation. And so as we look forward at where the rest of the state's likely to be moving uh, by the end of uh, the month, we hope, at least that's the signal we're getting from the governor's office, is that's where they're seeing the numbers trend. 
phase five would definitely allow in-person instruction, live instruction uh, in schools across the state. So as you're planning ahead, understand that if we are in phase five, uh, we'll be talking about at least some level of in-person instruction. We don't, again, don't know exactly what that looks like, uh, but we should have more information by the end of the month. Now, as I said before, moving to phase six requires a vaccine or some other ongoing method to control COVID uh, short of wearing masks and social distancing, right? Uh, and that's the post-pandemic phase. And you're only going to get past this with some way to treat COVID consistently to keep those numbers low, to stop the spread of the virus without having to rely on uh, the extreme measures we've been forced to use so far. So, uh, you know, with when we move post-pandemic, we're talking about everything opening back up, probably with some lasting safety requirements. There's going to be a lot of hand washing for a long time, um, but no more limits on social gatherings. And that's sort of back to business as usual. Um, although I don't know that as usual is going to mean the same thing that it used to, uh, given what we've learned from this virus. So with that, one of the questions that came in, Bob, was how are they defining small groups for gatherings? Well, for this example, came up yesterday, and I asked the governor's office that uh, exact thing, because we heard in the governor's press conference yesterday, hey, we're doing in-person instruction. And I said, hey, this report that you gave me a month ago right here says small group gatherings. This one's your, your press release says in-person instruction. What gives? Uh, there is no definition of small group gathering other than what we have in three different executive orders. And so the three different executive orders that matter are executive orders 110, 115, and 114. And we put all of those in an article that's up on our website and outlined what they all mean with relation to summer school. Um, and that's really what we're talking about at this point is summer school. We can't, we don't know what the regulations and restrictions are going to be for the fall yet. Those don't come out until the end of June, but for summer school, um, there is no particular limit on gathering size because it's not considered a social gathering. You're getting people together to learn. There's no express limit. Uh, what you do have to follow are the workplace safety guidelines in executive order 114, which include things like maintaining proper social distance, face coverings wherever possible, personal hygiene and hand washing. Uh, and again, all of those are outlined in a, um, an article on our website or in the MDE memo that most of you probably got. Uh, it's also up on MD's website. So as you're thinking about moving forward, if we're in phase three or we have to return to phase three, um, then we're going to continue to do the remote learning. So obviously in phase one through three is what we've just experienced, as Bob said, where that was there. The district really moving forward, thinking about phase three, is shifting beyond compassion over compliance and um, towards making sure that we have faith and accessibility for our EL students and students with disabilities. So as districts think to the future, these are things, that's a factor that needs to be considered because it's not gonna be accepted to continue to um, do our best but not necessarily address accessibility and fate um, even in a remote learning. So we need to rethink how we do that as we go into the next school year. As we think about um, phase four, which is obviously where Bob said lower Michigan is, um, one of the things to think about to mitigate for that size and terrorist question around the size of groups is to think about RTI and how do you approach tier one, two, and three. So one example, and Bob brought up summer school as one, another could be for our students with IEPs and 504 plans or our students with ELs um, that we need to provide additional services. How do we provide that compensatory education this summer through face-to-face -face instruction in small groups. How might we then thinking towards um, addition from that is whether that's summer school or during regular school year, how do we look to our tier two kids and look to them two days face to face and maybe three days remotely so that we can continue to have students come into our schools while our tier one students might be continuing to work remotely if we're still needing to look at this from a class size and capacity of our facilities as one example. We're in phase five, maybe our shift then is continuing to do tier three, but now that's face-to-face -face daily, Monday through Friday. Tier two, rather than being two days a week face-to-face, -face, now we're able to ramp up with more students within our physical space to provide them three days a week of face-to-face -face and maybe two days only remotely, allowing then our tier one students to come in two days face-to-face -face 
and our remote students, or excuse me, and then continue with the three days um, remotely. Another thing to be thinking about is from a calendar mitigation. As you know, our, our current calendar was based on our agricultural system in Michigan and across our country. And so our, we have extended summer breaks and yet schools in session when um, COVID-19 tends to thrive. So one of the things to be thinking about is how can we adjust our calendar like so many districts have around a balanced calendar so that we're suppressing and interrupting um, viral transmission through longer breaks during high risk times of year. So for example, if we were to look at starting the school year um, in August and finishing that first quarter by the end of October and then giving a break into November, which is typically the high flu season and oftentimes considered to be or, or predicted to be a high season for COVID-19, we're giving that break when people might be more socially isolated anyways. And students towards the end of that that do become sick or staff that do become sick would have a time of quarantine away from um, the other pieces. Coming back then, um, for a section of time and so on. So in doing a balanced calendar, it helps us to address the disease <coughs> outbreak. The other thing that this allows us to think about from a calendar is addressing our substitute and teacher shortage, how we might address that with inclement weather and things like the polar vortex that we had before. Another thing that um, has come out, and this comes from the work that Michigan State recently promoted around a 410 model for all students. Within this 410 model, um, it may be that students are coming to school four days a week, Monday through Thursday as an example, and they're attending all classes. And then on Friday, teachers would have time to collaboratively plan around the learning for the next two weeks that would be remote. And doing this too would help to mitigate for the viral transmission, allowing the building to be deeply cleaned and students to be more isolated for a period of time before returning for another um, four days on and two weeks off. With that said, if we have to continue to look at um, social distancing in the six foot space, given that most of our classrooms weren't designed for six foot distances between, we might need to look at our students in cohorts as we move forward. So a typical classroom might only, um, typically you might have 30, maybe upwards of 40 students in a classroom, tightly um, compacted around desks or tables. That with social distancing might be limited in a 30 by 30 classroom to 12, maybe 15 students. Some reports are saying even only six to eight because of the time that's in that space as well as the um, physical distance that's there. If that's the case, what you might look at is breaking your students into three different cohorts. So that one cohort would be in session for four days the first week while the other two cohorts are working remotely. From there then, a second cohort would be face-to-face -face, while the first and the third cohort are working remotely. And then during the third week, those students who had not been yet for face-to-face -face would come in while the other two are there. So it would be a rotational schedule building on the Ford um, 10 model. Um, for face-to-face -face and remote learning. Another option that might be considered is, um, was first put out there um, connected to the West Bloomfield model of two days on and then a deep clean and then two days off. In this model though, it's looking a little bit differently and taking into account feedback that we've received from students, parents, and staff. In this model, which was developed from a six period day, Rather than coming to school and completing six hours of coursework each day, a student would come to school and only do half their schedules for the first nine weeks. So rather than looking at a semester, look at a you know, semester's worth of content within a single quarter. So in this sense, we would be able to maximize or increase time around um, a task for a shorter duration so that students in cohort A would come to school Monday and Tuesday for three class periods. Teachers would be able to teach all three of those class periods and then have their um, uh, planning period on the Wednesday and then have a second group of students come in on Thursday, Friday. The benefit of this is reduced preps for teachers, the ability for teachers to teach three out of three and then over the course of a semester, six out of six, saving dollars and staffing at the um, district level 
but still promoting the collaborative planning and time for intervention support on that Wednesday. So in many, cal or in many master um, agreements, there may be language about how many minutes of planning. So in this case, we're just taking and consolidating planning on a single day. By doing so, it allows the building to have a deep clean before a separate group of students are in. So in a model like this, students would be in school for two days, full days. Teachers would be in school four days, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, planning remotely from home. While some might through Schedule B or their specific assignments be in on Wednesday to provide intervention, support, or address student activities. A modified version of that is the original four by four block. In this setting, you're having eight classes over the semester, but only four during the first quarter. And with this, you reduce the time from two hours on a three by four block to an hour and a half. This allows students to have a little bit more choice in their schedule. So if you're on a seven period day or an eight block schedule now, this might be a way to bridge that gap. Teachers may teach three out of four or four out of four, depending on how you bargain that, with then either time for planning on Wednesday or academic support and intervention for your tier two and three kids on Wednesday if teachers are there, and then Thursday and Friday. So this is a way to think about how you mitigate both space and time within a certain classroom with students, as well as increasing the intensity of the coursework when students are there. Another option that people have looked at is doing a split schedule. This one probably has the highest cost from a transportation point of view because you'll be making double the bus runs each and every day. But it does allow students to come to school um, four to five days a week. So in here, the class schedule is still an hour in length. If you have a six period day, that's an hour. And students are coming Mondays to their first three classes, Tuesday to their second three classes. Then there's a large chunk of time in the middle of the day for a deep cleaning or a semi-deep cleaning before a second shift of students come. And then repeat that with deep cleaning on Wednesday and then Thursday, Friday, you have that session. So although this allows students to come to school more frequently on a consistent basis, the downside to the schedule is transportation costs. It's a much longer day for your teachers and you'd likely need to provide a planning period in addition to that for each of those teachers as they go. From there then keep in mind that we already have options that exist for flexible learning options. Um, these have been around for several, um, for over a decade now. And starting in 2017-18 specifically, there was some virtual learning options that were identified through 21F and Section 50D. And in there it allows for um, virtual learning completely online. It includes project-based learning with seat time waivers and options for hours and days and waivers. One of the things that um, MESSP and other educational organizations have been having conversations about is putting out some schedules similar to um, the ones that we had there or some other alternatives in having those go to the department in being approved as a seat time waiver so that each individual district wouldn't need to submit their own waiver, but these would be pre-approved options that districts could consider going into next year given COVID-19. In addition to that, as MSU's reopening of schools white paper indicated, there are several things to be mitigating from a facilities point of view. And as we look to the facilities, it's important to note the impact of students and different groups of students that come in. The CDC recommends that districts thoroughly sanitize all facilities between each group of students. Um, so if we have the split schedule, we need to have time before and after each of those groups. If we go day to day, the advantage is um, by having those cohort approaches that Wednesday is we could do a deep cleaning once a week, reducing some of the custodial costs that go with that. For high risk areas, such as a bathroom, sanitation is recommended and needed on an hourly basis um, to be able to make sure that we address those things. They're even thinking about, and so I, although many schools have air conditioning and stuff, how do we actually um, open up the building to ventilate more thoroughly through windows and that being open? Which brings up one of the common questions, and Wendy had pointed it out there as well, regarding um, what type of personal protection um, do people need to wear um, as far as equipment and what's the implications of that? 
And so whether that's wearing masks or face coverings of some sort, whether that's using shields or rubber gloves or what to what degree do students and or staff need to wear things. And I think it's important to note that as schools, we've had dress codes for years that um, we've um, enforced. And so we need to be thinking about revising using our dress codes to reflect what are the things that are going to be needed in order to keep our students and staff safe at school, not only to mitigate the um, transmission of the virus within the school, but also then back to families and into the greater community. Callan, do you think that yep. this might be a good time to take a, a breather and, and answer a few questions? You bet. All right. So, you know, I think when you were going through those various schedules, I think it's really helpful to present people with options like you did and get people thinking about it. Um, in looking at those various options, I know some of the concerns that people have is continuity um, within the district. So, you know, having kids um, that are maybe a, a family has a student that's in elementary and one in middle school and one in high school even, so continuity between the buildings. Um, another thing that comes up is continuity um, within an ISD. So if you are going to have students going to a career tech center um, or shared services of some kind, you know, having an ISD wide schedule is, is obviously beneficial for that. And then thirdly, with looking at all of these options you've provided are pupil accounting concerns. So um, do you have any thoughts on, on kind of any of those topics? Um, and do you feel that these schedules that you're showing are really um, more like middle school, high school, or do you think that, that it could work district-wide? I think these schedules can work district-wide, and I think as we start to look at um, the reduced funding that's expected, it's going to be important that we really think about the efficiencies within our system. So it may be how do we bus by geographic locations rather than by our master schedule. So oftentimes we schedule kids in the classes based on their course selections and some have said then we're just going to split that schedule in half and half the kids are going to come on one day and half the other. But that doesn't take into account family structures, students from the fame family. It doesn't take into account um, transportation zones. So if for example, um, where I was principal before in, in Matawan, we had half the kids who essentially lived um, south of I-94 and half the kids north of 94. And so for decades, um, kindergartners, when it was half day, if you lived south of 94, it didn't matter, you went to AM Pindyard. If you lived north of 94, you went to the PM Kindergarten. There was no exception unless your parent um, were driving you itself. So how do we look to things like that in different neighborhoods or zones within our school and potentially schedule in that way because I think the cost of transportation alone within a budget is going to be something to mitigate. Secondly, when you think about elementary schedules already, they tend to block. You look at ELA blocks or math blocks, they tend to be extended times. And so this actually fits and builds upon that, but I think um, contextualizes it as an example of this three by four and four by four contextualizes it for a secondary schedule. So if you're on a trimester now, you somewhat do that already with your five period day. Although I know that some with the um, trimesters are looking at um, uh, mitigating that by having a um, certain number of cores each semester or each trimester and then the electives um, strategically placed within that or doing like what you might call a skinny where the elective is something you do on that off day, that Wednesday or something like that um, as a mitigation. Or in some schools, they're looking at classes like physical education as a year or a semester long class, but doing that completely remotely with students doing things from home for fitness and wellness. Um, the benefit of some of these schedules with this includes also how many kids are in the lunch area. So when we're thinking about mitigating for the cafeteria um, transition times, you've eliminated or minimized the number of transition or passing periods that somebody would need compared to a traditional six tri trimester, five period, six or seven or eight block schedule by doing that. Um, so I think those are pieces that are important. In this case also, every student's continuing, unlike this semester, to move forward with new learning. So the benefit of this type of schedule is that students have concentrated time in class with their teachers to provide, 
um, to receive um, instruction, guided support, and intervention so that when students are working remotely, it's almost like flipped learning. That's when they might be watching some recorded videos or some um, TED Talks or con work or um, some type of um, online curated curriculum. Um, that's there. So for example, Michigan Virtual put out their curriculum for free this spring, and um, we're working with them to look at how we can put that out there for all students through a learning management system in the fall so that students are able to do that. So teachers are spending less time having to curate and organize and try to monitor curriculum, but actually the students outside of school are interfacing through that online. Some are already doing that with E2020, Odyssey, Wear, Ingenuity. There's a lot of different vendors out there. But by doing that, it allows the class time to be used for mini lessons, for interventions, for supports. So I think these types of schedules actually are much more viable than a traditional. The other thing is it allows then that once we do have some type of solution or some type of, when I say solution, some type of um, vaccine or medication and we have the capacity to deal with it, that we could then, when we go into um, um, phase six, we could transition back to a more traditional schedule without having to redo our whole master schedule because we're just taking our current master schedule and splitting it in half or, or adjusting it in that way. So I do think those are some important factors. So um, we had a specific question about um, districts transporting students on these days. And I think you, you know, you, you brought up some different examples of how, um, you know, this type of schedule can help spread students out a bit. Um, but I don't really know that you could give any more specific of an answer about transportation until we get more direction um, from the governor's council in terms of number of students and space and things of that nature um, to help people think about busing. So I don't know if you have any, uh, any other thoughts about that before we dismiss that question. Just one last thing I'd have on that is um, just like the classroom, you can get about 12 to 15. Um, in looking at it, I've, um, we've mapped out on a 77 passenger bus, so a typical full-size bus, you can likely get 15 students. So um, I know one district, they said they're going to need 15 new buses. Well, we know that's not something that's in the budget, much less available. I mean, look at how long it takes to order buses and get them in. So I think that's another benefit of some of these modified schedules is that um, just as you're reducing the number of students within the building, you're reducing how many you have to transport to and from. So I believe um, the work that Opportunity Labs is doing as part of the governor's task force will provide us some. In looking at what they've done with other states, it is reducing it. Um, some of them look more like 20 students um, was what I was reading in some of the other state reports on a bus. And so, yeah, that, that would be a good place to look is um, Opportunity Labs has worked with other states to develop plans. Uh, Nebraska is one of those. Um, and they have some guidance on this. So I, I've seen the question out there about crystal ball and mitigating measures. I think Colin has a couple of slides on this and we can kind of both of us go back and forth on what we see going forward. But as far as transportation is concerned, remember that with all of this, the different phases, the expectation is that you maintain distance and wear face coverings, et cetera, to the extent possible. And that's key language, and that's new language in, in sort of phase four, phase five level where we are now. They're mandatory and no option down in phase one through three, but as you move further through the phases, these mitigation strategies become as possible, not in every circumstance, um, recognizing that there are going to be limits to what it's possible to do with, for example, getting kids to school while socially distancing them six feet apart on the bus. And so as you look to this list, and I know um, Steve Forsberg asked the question about what are the things you think mainly will be done. The two things that have proven to work the best is social distancing and masks. And so I believe those are going to be the two most um, critical pieces. And how do we do that? At the bottom where it says um, the little, uh, the question came out from Stephanie around um, cancel band choir and orchestra. Um, I left that in there, but I think it's important to note that in canceling, it's more about canceling large ensembles being together in one place. As a father of a band director um, and somebody who percussion has been very important to in his life, um, I know that they have found significant ways to make learning happen. 
But um, as an example of that, from a mitigating factor, um, when I was talking about those skinnies, rather than having the band meet as a whole, there was 200 kids in the band, rather than having the band meet as a whole, they took the band and spread it out over the entire day. So each section met so that they were able to do the six foot distancing in order to make that. And then they use the remote learning time to add in things like sight reading, remote music, and those types of things. Note that in one of the resources we're going to be putting out there with this presentation is guidance from the Association of Court, um, Vocal Music um, um, Instructors. And so there's guidance on what vocal music specifically, but it carries over into band and orchestra, might look like for early elementary, later elementary, middle school, and high school. But putting all those kids into a classroom or onto a stage um, without being able to social distance because not only is it their proximity to each other, but because they're singing or they're playing their instrument, the um, transmission of um, droplets is significantly higher than in a traditional classroom. So those are pieces to be considered of, considerate of. So adding to that, I think this is a great place to answer the question we had about uh, an in-person graduation in August. Somebody asking, we're planning an, in an inside August 8th graduation with 250 graduates and a guest or two. What do we think? Um, I will tell you that even if you were in northern Michigan right now, which is in phase five, and phase five is the furthest we can go without any sort of a uh, vaccine, the inside social gathering limit is 50 people. So I just don't see any circumstance in which you can fit 250 graduates plus guests in an inside space uh, until we move to phase six. So, um, it's, you know, Molly asked, um, do you predict that well, we won't start with 100% attendance just because of social distancing? Because all the plans that we're presenting are kind of a hybrid of um, in-person and remote. And although, you know, both of you kind of alluded to this, um, Molly, I think the thing that's important is that basically schools are going to have to be nimble here and they're going to have to have plan A, B, and C ready to go because, you know, uh, even if even if uh, things were great, we had really uh, solid, um, you know, we uh, reduction in cases and we're ready to start school with everyone 100% in person, the odds of there being another spike or uh, a positive case in your school in particular or something of that nature happening where you might need to then transition to all remote or partially remote is likely. So I think that's why you've probably heard, you know, many districts kind of rolling out, you know, a variety of plans because you're going to have to react to what's happening uh, at any given time. I think when you consider that, um, although the four, the initial four days on 10 days off plan did consider having all students there. Um, the, the challenge is going to be the transportation, the food services, um, and that type of thing. So, which goes to um, Will's question specific to lunch periods. Um, I do think that there may be lunch periods where people might go to a cafeteria or something, um, but it's going to be with significantly less students there, and it's likely going to be more pre-packaged or box lunches and not the buffet style that we've um, become accustomed to and some of our providers have done for us. So you're going to be looking at more of a sack lunch type of thing. I think from looking at some of the other state guidances, there's even guidance around what students are even able to bring from home versus what this, they have to have from the school itself. So yes, I think that we're going to be starting school with the reduced caseload of students on a, any given day. So our plans kind of looked at it from a half a caseload um, and any single day, as well as a third of a caseload, depending on how um, what class sizes are. I know that in looking at who's with us, we have several um, smaller school districts that may only have 30 students in their entire building. So in those places, you may have um, all of your students present just because of your class size. Where in another school, they've been averaging 35, 40 kids in a class, and it's not like there's a tree of teachers waiting to be hired out there, nor is there a tree of money to be able to hire a, a bunch of new teachers to manage that. So I think we're going to have to think differently about um, how we use time and space given 
um, the need to mitigate for transmission through time, through those two factors. The other thing you might want to keep in, in mind with regard to Colin's comment about managing space, your lunchroom it may be one of the best large gathering spaces you have in your school. Uh, you may need that for instructional purposes or if you're doing a cohort mitigation approach uh, where some students are in the building on a regular basis, you may need that space as a place for students to come and work when they can't be at home. So, you know, yeah, you may want to consider things like having students eating lunch to some extent in their classes if possible, just so that you're freeing up the available space you have for other uses. Uh, we also had a question from um, Vicki about um, thinking about managing staff who um, not one teacher having to deal with all the remote students and the students that they have in a blended format or face-to-face. -face. Um, and, you know, I think there's been a lot of, of creative things. And once again, this is a lot determined on what you were just talking about, Colin, the number of, um, the number of students that you have in your building. If there's only one ninth grade ELA teacher, that doesn't give you a lot of flexibility, right? But if you happen to have, um, you know, two or three sections of language art design, maybe one teacher is doing the online teaching and the other is doing face-to-face. -face. So um, I'm even hearing at elementary level uh, things where um, there are three sections of third grade, but one of the third grade teachers is doing the math for all of those students. One is doing ELA for all of those students. So I think that there's a lot of creative things going on out there and there's not just like one, you know, one model or one answer to that question, Vicki. The other yep, thing I'd add to that, Vicki, is um, you're going to have some staff who may not, may be in an at-risk group and may not be able to come to school physically. Uh, so there are going to need to be some considerations around how to accommodate not just students, but staff uh, who aren't in a position to come to school uh, in person. So that's a good transition then to this idea of the collaborative approach. Um, and how do we actually take into consideration not only our students' needs, our families' needs, but our staff needs? Mike um, brought up the question around workload and varying schedule. Just know that these schedules that we're putting out here, we've actually explored with the Michigan Education Association. We've been working in partnership with them for the last five, six weeks, looking at mitigating factors. Um, what I can share with you is thus far the most popular option that's been out there is the three by four block. Um, the MEA um, really appreciates this approach. In fact, I thought there may be pushback to teachers teaching three out of three and not having a planning period each day, but they haven't. They've actually thought this notion that one, they have reduced number of prep. So rather than prepping for six classes every day, um, five days a week, I'm prepping for three classes, but I'm really only coming up with two lessons. So the burden for preparation of face-to-face -face is significantly reduced. Secondly, by having an extended um, block of time, you're not interrupted um, as much and you can actually dig into what you're doing on that Wednesday was seen as a positive. The third piece that they brought up is there's less students and parents to have to communicate with. So from that lens, they appreciate the opportunity that they could get to know students for a shorter period in a more intense um, way around their learning and have a conversation. So think about it in this way, rather than 150 to 180 students on your caseload, you're looking at between 60 and 90 students on a caseload um, to work with that way. So that's, that's where um, that block schedule um, has received the most positive feedback from the teachers unions um, as we explored those options. Um, and I think as we've talked to students about the options, that's the other one that comes in. But at the end of the day, every district has local needs and capacities. So I think that's an important reason why as a district, one of the first steps you need to take is to have conversations and kind of almost do an, an autopsy of what worked, what didn't work, and what would people like to do differently. So those who have been part of our leader to leader are familiar with the four questions that we've been asking over time of students, um, teachers, administrators, superintendents, and those are things that um, those lessons learned should inform what we're looking to. So with all that said, um, there's a lot of things to be thinking about, but at the end of the day, we also have to wait to see what are some of the decisions that are coming out of Lansing. So 
What you're looking at here is, is an organizational chart that I threw together. This started as a sketch on the back of a napkin when Wendy and I were trying to explain to some folks exactly who all these different groups were and how they were going to build. Uh, and so what you're seeing here is uh, the Governor's Return to School Advisory Council, which is working right now. That's the group that we were just told yesterday is going to come out with their recommendations by June 30th. That advisory council is the group that consists of educators, and health experts, and others. They are working with Opportunity Labs, this group that we referenced, which is a nonprofit, a national nonprofit, to work with the governor's COVID-19 task force on education to develop the plan. And essentially, those two groups are having input, Opportunity Labs and the advisory council are having input. The task force is going to come up with their report, their recommendation, and that is what they're going to pass on to Governor Whitmer, uh, which we're told is what she's going to put out with an executive order and a final plan on June 30th. Now, concurrently with all of this, the Department of Education formed its own set of groups, a rural schools group, a suburban schools group, and an urban schools group uh, that they're calling their reopening of school work groups. And there are a whole lot of principals and other educators that got looped into that, uh, including Wendy. Uh, and so they're doing some other work around this. Some of it is paralleling what uh, the advisory council is working on. Some of it isn't, and we'll get into the outcomes in a second. But in this, what you need to remember is the governor's advisory council is advising the task force who's advising the governor. Dr. Michael Rice from MDE is a member of that task force. And so not only is he getting input from the advisory council, he also has these MDE reopening school work groups working within the department and under his auspices, providing additional input into what's going forward up to the governor. Then when you add in the next layer, which is where statewide organizations come in, uh, you're looking at, Colin, could you advance the slide? You're looking at all these different statewide groups and organizations that are working sort of in parallel but aren't necessarily tied to this process. And that's where MAISA and the ISDs and the GELN are putting together a series of recommendations. As Colin referenced, we've been working with the MEA on a number of things. The CPED councils are working on putting together how to do CTE with all of this. Michigan Virtual's got their own piece of this. So let's take a look very quickly at who all, you know, all these different groups, now that we have an idea of who they are and where they fit in the greater structure, what outcomes might they be coming out with uh, as we move forward. So the Gov's task force we found out yesterday is focused on specific health and safety requirements and protocols that schools are going to have to meet in order to reopen. And so we got a question from Steve Forsberg earlier about what does our crystal ball say? What do we think is going to be in there? Uh, you saw what Colin put forward from MSU, and that was the resource that he um, referenced in his last set of slides. In the chat, I linked to guidance from Nebraska on health and safety. Nebraska's guidance was done in collaboration with Opportunity Labs, which is the same group that's working with our task force. And so those are two potential resources to look at as a crystal ball. Although what we do know is that our recommendations aren't gonna come until June 30th and they are individualized to Michigan. Uh, so they could look different than what, what else is out there. We also know that that group is likely gonna be coming out with additional recommendations for schools to follow uh, regarding health and safety that, exceed, that schools could use to exceed the minimum standards. Finally, we know that the task force recommendations are gonna be tied to the phases that we reviewed at the beginning of all of this and using the Merck regions. Those are the eight regions around the state. Uh, although their goal is if they can get more granular health data to maybe even allow opening, and clo uh, opening of um, flexibility for schools by county. Now, Wendy's point on this was very valid, which is schools have to be nimble because I think what we're going to see as we move forward through this is as infection rates pop up in certain areas of the state, certain areas of the state are going to move backward. They may be in phase five to start the year and move to phase four or be in phase four to start the year and move up to phase five. So there's, you're not just going to have to deal with whatever the set of rules is at the beginning of the year, but also as the rules change moving through the year. Um, now, the MDE work groups are a separate uh, cat entirely. Uh, they're more focused at the moment, at least from what we know, on a broad list of concerns and solutions for reopening schools, 
through the specific lens of the district location, urban, rural, or suburban. They're informing, as I said, the Department of Education on next steps in terms of their rules and policies that need to be addressed. So not just the overall task force report on health and safety, but those specific rules MDE has control over. One of those things that MDE has direct control over is pupil accounting. And so as we're looking at alternative models, and as Colin talked about things like seat time waiver, our rules around pupil accounting don't anticipate global pandemic. Uh, and so while we do have some flexibility, that's likely going to need to be updated, shifted, and evolve in order to deal with the reality on the ground that we're seeing, which is where we could see some spin-off groups to work on specific identified items within MDE's purview, and potentially even moving into the fall possible future work in response to what the governor's task force comes out with and what we're seeing on the ground in schools. You can move ahead to the next slide. So then within this, we have all these other exterior groups. Uh, MAISA is working on short and long-term guidance to support schools uh, focused around their three work groups of instruction, wellness, governance. Uh, we've been working at MASSP on a series of resources that you can find out on our website, including a series of autopsy surveys uh, that Colin put uh, with uh, Matt Alley from our staff, put a lot of time into. Uh, we've been working on a principal's reopening schools checklist with a bunch of recommendations and other supports. Uh, and uh, Colin's been putting a lot of time in on the Maven solution, which is an LMS uh, that's free completely to schools to use. Along the same lines on LMS, Michigan Virtual has been looking at professional learning models for high quality and remote learning environments and a decision matrix for selecting. They've also been vetting online content. While the CPED councils have been focused on figuring out how to deliver CTE content given social distancing and the other requirements uh, that are in place now and bringing together groups of like programs to discuss best practices uh, and share um, resources. So in the end, by coordinating our efforts, we're hoping that we're not duplicating or sending conflicting messages. And so currently we'll be um, in this one putting out resources for MASSP and in the coming weeks um, being able to put out a um, consolidated message from all of these organizations um, that are listed here. Um, the other is, um, and Ann Blankenhorn's question about schedules and childcare and that type of thing. And one of the benefits to each of those modified schedules is that you could still provide childcare. It's about dedicating this space. And so as we looked at even that cohort model of op opportunities, um, that's an important piece to think about is what space do you have dedicated, whether it's for essential workers, for um, including your teachers and or administrators who have children in your district that are gonna need childcare during that time or for other families, um, because that's a huge part of the impact on our economy has been parents needing to work from home as their students are there. So what is that gonna look like as we go forward? Alan, I know that uh, there are districts also that are looking at um, you know, the potential of the in-person instruction going to elementary students um, and utilizing um, pretty much every facility they have at their disposal in the district uh, just to be able to bring in elementary kids and thinking more about remote learning for their um, yeah. secondary students. So uh, in terms of that question Anne asked, it's not related to a three by four schedule, but just looking for solutions to be able to do that. Uh, I know there's a lot, of, a lot of discussion and a lot of ideas happening. Yeah, there are several schools that are actually looking at K-5 being face-to-face -face every day with half the students in class. And so they're prioritizing their face-to-face -face for those students. And then 6-8 is looking at a blended approach. And then 9-12 is completely online. And so by doing so, they're able to use and maximize the facility. The other that we're seeing people do is look to um, community centers as another place. So how do we utilize staff or um, space differently? And so whether it's through churches, community centers, um, and others to be able to tap into in order to accommodate the number of students that are there. So Bob, I don't know if you can answer Molly's question, but it was about uh, 500 um, student venues or I, I just typed Molly a, a lengthy answer quoting executive order 115 with a link. So uh, if that doesn't answer it, Molly, I got nothing. <laughs> 
All right. So as we're going, and Bob mentioned this whole autopsy, we know that a lot of schools have surveyed their staff or their students and staff about things, but it hasn't necessarily been from the lens of really what worked necessarily and what were the skills developed in the challenges that were faced. And as we've done these listening tours, we came away with seven lessons. And as we've been working with districts, providing coaching and, and facilitating sessions within the district, seven things keep coming up. The first is around accessibility. How do we ensure that students are able to access the content? How do we ensure that staff have accessibility? So that includes um, hardware, software, internet, cellular signal, um, and the like. It also has to do with accessibility of students with IEPs and 504 plans and what type of assistive technology is available for them when they're working remotely. The second thing that was a strong um, message, particularly from students, was asynchronous versus synchronous learning. A huge takeaway is that expecting students to arrive online at a similar time um, is not very sensitive to their local needs um, or to their local home and the needs within that home. That students um, have much um, better success when things are asynchronous so that something may go out each night at midnight and they have until midnight the next day to complete it or it goes out every Monday morning and it's due by Sunday night. So having opportunities where kids can access it anytime, anywhere, recognizing that in some homes there may only be one device or bandwidth for one device to access. We know that um, in providing um, those types of opportunities, there's also considerations around attendance versus engagement. We've um, heard anywhere from 5% engagement upwards of 80% engagement, with attendance being more um, where kids show up for something in the 50 to 80% range in some districts up to 90. But how do we shift from just showing up to something and turning your screen black to actually engaging? That's where um, a lot of the asynchronous learning opportunities come from. Fourth, students and parents want a predictable workflow. So what is it daily, weekly that needs to be done? And can we provide them some type of daily or weekly to-do list so that they can project management? And then that goes to having a consistent approach. I think many districts, um, out of compassion, um, allowed a lot of autonomy to teachers to figure out what works best for them. And what students and families have shared with us is that that doesn't necessarily work in their household. To have to worry about, is it a Zoom or a Google Meet or um, uh, Microsoft Team? Are we using Seesaw today? Are we using Google Classroom today? Are we going through which one of those others? So having a consistent approach that the district is using, at least at a building level, but even with um, families with children at multiple levels, having a, a consistent one there. From there then, it's important that there's feedback. A lot of times students were doing work and they didn't even know whether or not that work had been collected or um, whether the teacher had even looked at it. From there then, although sometimes they said grades, when you poke deeper, they really wanted feedback. Are they on the right track with their work? So not just a checkbox that I did it, but am I on the right track? Am I learning what I need to learn? And then the last lesson we learned is they appreciated personal check-ins in the wellness checks, making sure we're thinking about the whole child and caring from that way. We were able to do that because of the um, autopsy we did by asking questions of them, which looks to eight local decisions that are essential for you as you move forward. First is communication and engagement, that regardless of what comes from these other organizations, the first and foremost thing you need to do is to communicate and engage your stakeholders around their experience, whether that's applying surveys, doing focus groups. If you need assistance with that, please reach out. We can help support that and facilitate that. Coming up with a reopening of school core planning team. So if you don't have one now, we should be looking at six to eight adults within that school, as well as some parents and or students that can help to make decisions about where you're going and collect feedback on the plan. We need to be thinking about what policies and procedures from transportation and health to what we're gonna do the first day, first week of school. What about attendance on um, those types of pieces? To be able to do that, we really need to be clear about what that student experience is going to be and what's the staff experience. So if a teacher's teaching all day long, 
then who's helping with the remote learning? How do we maximize other staff in order to support students? What are students doing when they're in school? What are they doing when they're outside of school? If we're using class time, when students are there to provide lectures, what is it they're gonna, when are they gonna get the support of the adult to help them with the learning? So things like that. So how do we use space and schedule? Third, we need to be thinking about our master schedule. So we put out a bunch of different options. Um, the question came up about trimester. So I did um, share flipping from a three by, or a five by three, which is what a trimester is now, five classes during three trimesters. Some schools are looking at going to three classes over five um, terms. So you're taking six week, um, five to six week terms to complete a class. Um, so what is that master schedule? How are we going to use the facilities based on the guidance that we have? What does that mean then for the pre-service training that we do before school starts? What training do we need for our teachers to ramp up from where we were with pandemic learning to being able to really facilitate face-to-face, -face, remote, and blended learning in a high-quality fashion? So what are those approaches? What are the schedules that we need to make sure that we put into place? How do we set up rooms? We spend all this time putting kids into table groups and, and now all of a sudden we're gonna have to push people apart into individual seating arrangements. So what does that look like? We have new teachers, um, hopefully that you're gonna be able to support. So what are we doing for them? I know MASSP is putting together a whole new staff orientation that's gonna be available online for those who need it. Um, as well as additional training for administrators about how do you do observation and feedback as an example in a remote environment. From there, then, really giving direction to your teachers around that opening day, week, month, term. What are those opportunities that are there? How are we going to mitigate? And how are we going to address those students who are most in need moving forward? How can we use this time this summer um, where we can have small groups together to really do some evaluations? I think we tend to do that better in our elementary. What could we be doing with our secondary students to really understand where they are after this last year so we can pinpoint where we need to start with English 10, 11 and so on as we go forward. And then from there, really put that plan into place so that we have a place to assess, recognizing that change is inevitable. So by looking at where our current state is, identifying what our desired state is, we can then start to map out a plan in order to get there. So with that, here's some things we'd like you to really summer or think about in the here and now. First, Think about calendar. How can we maximize time? How do we flex time in order to provide contingency and the services our students need? How might we schedule students through cohort split or blended approaches in order to make that happen? How do we continue to provide the food services, social emotional, student mental health, and monitoring of health that's needed for that? Those are three things we should be doing right now, considering, exploring, and having conversations with our stakeholders about. From there then, once we get the guidance at the end of July, or excuse me, at the end of June into the early of July, then we can start looking at the logistics and safety to be able to mitigate even further. And from there, I know MHSA put out some guidance around student activities, and I believe we're gonna have more as Opportunity Labs and the department put out official guidance. So the things on the left are the things that we should be thinking about now. The pieces that logistics, safety, and student activities are things that I think are more within July. And then as school starts, we need to be ready to um, manage that change moving forward. So with that, I think we've been addressing most of the questions, but if you have additional questions, I know we're short on time, but if you have additional questions that you'd like to ask, please do add that within um, the Q&A function. And if you'd like to ask a question verbally, we can unmute those if you raise your hand. Colin, I'll throw out one. Uh, Kristen asked a question. Has there been any more chatter in regard to federal funding so the districts can avoid, uh, afford these additional expenses? Short answer, no. Uh, there's talk about it, but um, the uh, bill that passed the legislature, Michigan legislature yesterday that spent the first bit of federal relief money didn't really have anything for Ed. There hasn't been any indication from the Fed around what additional money, if any, they're going to be allocating. We just know we've got a giant budget hole uh, and right now not enough resources to fill it. Second question, Bob, and it kind of goes to the space thing. Athletics are running now. What about spectators? 
Okay. So the spectators are included in your person limit. You can have outdoor gatherings up to a hundred people with social distancing. That includes coaches, students, spectators, trainers, everybody. So that's your rule. Uh, that's pretty well covered in, oh, I think it's executive order 110. Um, but I know we've got a couple of different articles on this on our website, including the one that summarized sort of where things stand right now. The other thing I think that's to take in mind is yes, athletics and student activities can pick up right now, but that's with social distancing. So there's one thing for off season conditioning that's able to be done with social distancing. Think about the sports that are coming in the fall and which one of those sports can actually be done with social distancing. Are you going to be able to play football with everybody six feet apart? Are we playing? I mean, it, would, it would have made play? my job as an offensive lineman much easier. <laughs> what are we thinking about with, um, with um, volleyball? Is that something that can be done? Whereas tennis or soccer. So I think we have to really think through that. Yes, they can pick up with activities now, but depending on the guidance that ends up coming out, it may be permissible for off-season conditioning, but I'm not sure about the actual competition and what's needed to be able to put those in place, much less have spectators at them. So those are things that we're going to wait to um, receive additional guidance for. Um, but I would be very, um, I'd be interesting to see what, what that says, because I think it's going to be hard um, for many of these athletic programs to be able to um, start up again um, with the social distancing guidelines that are required. Remember, you've also got MHSAA has put out guidance around athletics. Uh, the state has a group that's working on non-collegiate and non, non-scholastic athletics, so like little league stuff, uh, that's consulting with MHSAA. So we could be getting more guidance in addition to what's coming for sure June 30th from the Governor's Task Force. So with that, we have some resources. So we've talked about doing an autopsy or survey. So we put together a survey. It's available in three languages for families and students, including English, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, we have a teacher survey. It is only available in English. We did not translate that. It's longer, but it will, it's one that I would encourage you to get every one of your teachers to complete anonymously so that you can really look at the skill sets that your teachers were able to apply and what skills may be missing and need to be addressed. The principal's checklist um, is available also, and that walks you through from an expectations and communications, what are all the things you might be thinking about needing to address with a place for progress monitoring and determining who's going to do what. There's also hyperlinks to resources and sample documents for those tasks, not all of them, but many of them, um, thanks to the great work of um, principals who volunteered to be part of that task force. In addition to that, we've put a link into MSU's reopening of schools. It's a very nice, succinct white paper. We showed some of their graphics within this um, as an example. A much more comprehensive, detailed um, playbook is the Transcend Educational Instructional Playbook that we have there. Um, with that one, though, it is um, much more detailed. So if you um, don't like a lot of detail, that's not the one to go to. And know that the Michigan um, State will, or excuse me, the um, um, State of Michigan will be putting out their opportunity um, labs piece there, but these will be coming to you. When you click on the MASSP resources, they do require you to make a copy so that then you're able to do any type of um, adaptations, changes you want. So if you want to add questions, delete questions, it allows you to collect all the data yourself. And that includes the principal's checklist. It will require you to make a copy, but then you can make any changes to it. Um, you have um, complete permission and, um, autonomy to adjust as you see fit, which is the requirement for making the copy. So with that, I think we've addressed questions. So we want to thank you for joining us today and know that on July 1, yes, right before 4th of July, on Wednesday, July 1, MASSP will be hosting a town hall at 10 a.m. And during that town hall, um, we hope to unveil um, the um, Governor's Task Force report as well as be able to share with you some NDE guidance and then the consolidated resources that we've been coordinating efforts with GELN, MAISA, MASA, and Michigan Virtual. So that's our um, timeline for our next steps. Today is to get you thinking and at least to get you started on the conversations and the autopsy of your past practice. When we get back together on July 1, it's really gonna be about putting meat on the um, bone and, and really trying to look at 
how do we make this happen based on your local context. So thank you for joining us today. We wish you well as you go into this um, um, challenging um, next phase of remote learning and possibly, hopefully sooner than later, face-to-face -face instruction. Thanks everyone.